1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind, so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others, as faithful stewards of God's grace in various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Uh, this text really began back in chapter 3 again with the exhortation to suffer for doing good. In verses 1 through 6, Peter told us something very important. He told us to, whoops, he told us to arm ourselves with the attitude of Christ. Now, in verses 1 through 6, that was primarily about don't sin, right? And to do so because we know that bodily will die, but spiritually will be made alive. So, so don't live in sin, you know, conform to Christ and this new life you have with him. Now, in verses 1, or sorry, through 7 through 11, instead of don't sin, it's more like live in love. So the first part, if you could, of Jesus' attitude is don't sin. And the second part of Jesus' attitude, if you will, is live in love. And... Um, so with that, let's jump in. Peter begins with just a statement. This is just the reality. The end of all things is near. Uh, we see that and we're like, you know, Peter, you wrote that 2,000 years ago. <laughs> Doesn't seem like it's that that's that near, but uh, this is the last age. This church age, it is the last age um, uh, for for this time uh, of life on earth um, where there's sin and there's a savior and there's uh, salvation and all of these things. Uh, heaven is going to be perfect. There's not going to be all of the, the trials and the difficulties that we have here. And this is going to come to an end. We're not going to be in this situation forever. And so there's a lot of, um, I guess, urgency. That's the word. Urgency that comes from realizing that you live in this age where the end is nigh. The end of all things is near. Uh, by the way, you know, this, this principle, it was still true in the Old Testament. You can go look at a psalm, like Psalm 90, which just reminds us to number our days because we are just vapor in the wind. We are flowers that come up in the morning and they're gone by the evening. And so, uh, in any case, just this, this start, it starts with this, you know, reminder that this is urgent. Living in love is an urgent matter. And so he gives us a series of commands. He says, therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. Such an interesting statement. The so that is important. So, therefore, that's the, you know, he's building off of that statement and off of arming yourselves with the mind of Christ. Be alert, right? As a watchful and sober-minded, clear thinking, so that you may pray. You can't pray if you're not alert and you're not sober. At least you not pray truthfully, not pray accurately. And so to have good prayers, we must be alert and sober-minded. Above all, this is the most important thing, this next command. Love each other deeply. Uh, this is for the believer one of the most important commands that we'll ever receive is to, not one of, it is the most, right? To love God and to love others. This is at the core of what we're supposed to be doing. The gospel makes this possible. But just in case you needed another reason, it is because love covers a multitude of sins. It's for many reasons. I mean, think about how much love prevents sin from taking place in the first place. Uh, you have two people that are about to fight, and one of them decides, I'm not going to fight. I am going to love. Well, they save that whole rest of sinful argumentation from taking place. But more than that, uh, and I think what's more in mind of Peter's mind here is that love covers a multitude of sins, is that when somebody does sin against you, maybe they offend you in some, some, some way, if you're able to just lovingly let that go right there in the moment, then you've, you've covered, if you will, their sin in that moment. It's not that it's gone. 
but that you keep it from being uh, an issue. You overlook the offense. You're eager and ready to forgive. And now there, of course, are limits to this. Um, and sometimes it is necessary for us to challenge someone and confront somebody in their sin. But in general, love covers many sins. And there's a lot of wisdom in just being able to say, I'm not going to let that get to me. The next command, offer hospitality. Let's just number these, by the way. Stay alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. Love one another deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another. I love this without, whoops, without grumbling, right? Because we, we do grumble. We can think of their culture as one that's so hospitable. It must come easy to them. They were hospitable because it was easy. We don't have to be as hospitable because it's not easy for us. If it was easy for them, I assure you, uh, Peter never would have told them to do so without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gifts you have received to serve others. Use your gift to serve others. And this reminds us of 1 Corinthians, right? Where all spiritual gifts have been given for the edification of the body. But he adds an, a modifier to that, which is very important, as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. And this is important. So we've got an identity here. I am a steward. It's not mine. It has been given to me for a period of time, and I need to take good care of it. I'm a steward of God's grace. The gift you have is God's grace. So those two things are linked in its various forms, right? The, the, the gifts of God take, the spiritual gifts of God take on various forms. And our goal is to be faithful in the use of them. And this is important because faithfulness is directed towards God, which means that you use your gift in the way that God has called you to use it, in the place that God has called you to use it, in the ways that God has called you to use it, and you let go of the results. You let go of results. In America, we're so results-based. Uh, what does Paul say in 1 Corinthians 3? He says, I planted, uh, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. You're faithful to God. God says, go plant seeds, you plant seeds. God says, go water seeds, you water seeds, but you let God give the, go the growth. So we're being faithful to God's grace in its various forms. And then he gives an example of that here in these verses. If anyone speaks, they should do, and this is kind of an if-then statement, then they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. Another if-then statement, if anyone serves, then they should do so with the strength that God provides. And then we get our purpose clause at the end. So that, why, why, if we're going back here, why should I, why should those who speak do so as one who speaks the very words of God? And why should one who serves do so in the strength that God provides? It is so that God may be praised through Jesus Christ. So Jesus' whole earthly ministry is to bring glory to the Father. He is the one giving gifts through the Holy Spirit to the church. And if those gifts are uh, for the serving of others, they are also for the glory of God, okay? So these two things are linked. Serving God, or sorry, glorifying God and serving others should be very much linked in the practice of our spiritual gifts and implementing them. If anyone serves, they should, so uh, so let's break this down real quick, by the way. If anyone speaks, they should do so as, as one who speaks the very words of God. So this is a call for all teaching, uh, prophetic, uh, word of wisdom, like every possible spiritual gift that's related to words, which is like half of them, you do so as one speaking the words of God. So if you're not so sure that, that this is from the Lord, that maybe this is from you, then don't say it, right? And if you're going to say it, it better be truthful. It better be accurate. It better be true to the nature of God, like a prophet, right? Speak as one who speaks the very words of God. And so for anybody in teaching, uh, preaching role, you need to be able to say, thus saith the Lord. No, now, don't say it <laughs> uh, unless the Lord has actually said those things to you. But you need to speak as if they are the very words of God. You need to be that sure that this is of the Lord. You need to be sure that that is 
truthful. It's a high bar, very high bar, right? And, it, and two ways you'll know that that's the case is that they're building others up and that they're bringing glory to God. Second example, if anyone serves, they should do so with the strength that God provides. It's so easy for us to do things in our own strength. So hard to do them in the strength that the Lord provides. This takes prayer. This takes humility. This takes um, dependence. This takes uh, mindfulness. Mindfulness to slow down and say, I'm not going to do this in my own strength. I'm going to sit here and pray for 30 minutes before I go talk to this individual so that I don't speak to them with my words, so that I don't serve them with my strength, but that I, I serve in the strength that God provides. In that way, uh, God, again, will be praised. He will get the glory through Jesus Christ. And then it ends with a, we call it doxology, a word of praise to him. And we have to ask, of course, to who is the him? Is that to Jesus or is it to God the Father? But based on what we just seen, that God may be praised, then we may assume that it is God to God the Father. Be glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. And that is 1 Peter uh, chapter 4, verses 7 through 11.